so much for that wonderful, wonderful song. My name is uh, Pastor Jean Clouzet, um, and um, just waiting for my PowerPoint. I was talking about that, um, or Canva, sorry, PowerPoint, so archaic, so archaic, Canva. All right, and, uh, and I was talking about that. I don't, you know, like I'm watching Pastor Dave struggle with some of the slides. So sometimes you become too dependent on the, on the slides, you know, so I, just having that sermon. All right, um, attitudes. We've been talking about attitudes, and the attitudes have really touched me. I've really been following. I, I mean, you guys have been benefiting from Pastor Dave's sermons. Is Pastor Dave here? Can I make eye contact with him? No? He's not here? Wherever you are, Pastor Dave. I'm, I'm, I'm connecting with you. I'm connecting with you. I'm really following it. I'm really connecting with it. And so I asked him, one of the staff, he said he, he invited me to speak. And, and um, I, I realized when I actually got here and, and uh, started working as a chaplain pastor here at, at Thunderbird Adventist Academy, I was like, man, this is going to be the first Sabbath I don't preach in like seven years because I've been preaching every Sabbath for like a long time, very long time. So it's, it's kind of a weird reprieve at the same time. So attitude in the waiting. I want to I wanna preface this by saying I'm a fourth generation pastor's kid. Okay? Amen. But it's kind of like a purple unicorn. Right? There's not much of us. There's not many of us left, right? Plus, have you met pastor's kids? We're not well, all right? We're not doing well, really. I, I, I feel like I should be up here, and, but, but I, I can't do it. I like to be at eye contact level, and I like to walk around. Plus, if the kids are on their phones, I like to get really close and just be like, just stand over uncomfortably. It's fantastic. Um, it's all good. It's all good, guys. You're going to do it. I know it's, 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 the adults are doing it, too. I see you adults. It's all good. Well, my Bible's not here. All right. Fourth generation pastor's kid. Fourth generation's pastor's kid. And I grew up with really, what I now understand is amazing families. I, I grew up in Seventh-day Adventist meccas. I grew up in Argentina. My native tongue is Spanish. And uh, I grew up in a place that was like 95% Adventist. I mean... There wasn't even alcohol being sold on, in the town. There's no cigarettes being sold. Everybody was Adventist. People from other towns would come to our town to rob us, you know, because we were doing so well. We were being blessed by the Lord, you know? Um, you know, and it still is kind of like that to this day. Seventh-day Adventism has the distinction of if you holistically follow the message, it lifts a person from one social strata to the next. Because what's it doing for people? It's, um, it's hitting, it's, it's affecting your finances, it's affecting your health, it's affecting your education. And you know, if you do positive things in that regard, what happens to you? Yeah, you're gonna improve. <laughs> you're gonna improve in absolutely every single way. But as I grew up there and I watched my grandfather, grandfather's a pastor, other grandfather was a missionary, teacher, architect, jack of all trades, founded a, a mission school in Bolivia, built it up with his bare hands, with no architecture degree, built all the buildings, he built his own house. Sometimes when I look at my grandparents, I'm like, and I, then I, you know, I just turned 40 and sporty, right? And I'm like, I have done nothing with my life. <laughs> I'm a failure. Uh, but both of those grandfathers, and grandmothers to a certain extent, they went to sleep telling me that Jesus Christ was coming back in their lifetime. Now, everybody goes through their ups and downs and their dark night of the soul. You go out searching. I don't know what the Adventist version of Rumspringa is, right, but we have it. You know, sometimes people, it's like, go study abroad, and apparently when you go to the other schools, you know, Jesus can't see you over there because your parents can't see you. And people do 
fun things, and I have fun memories of watching my fun friends doing fun things that weren't super Seventh-day Adventist and made me question everything. But when they died and Jesus didn't come back, I had to re-examine some things. For the longest time, it was my parents' religion, it was my parents' denomination, it was my everything else's religion, it wasn't mine. So my question is, what do we do while we're waiting? What's our attitude to be while we're waiting? Because that's the big problem, right? Jesus hasn't come back. We are seventh day, what? Christians? Adventists. It's, it's based on the second coming of Jesus. And he hasn't come back. And not only that, we compound that with the fact that we live in a first world country. All right? Sorry, I should have, I should have hit this next slide. Okay? Because some people have questions. I, I, I'm going to keep going with the introduction. All right? And it'll probably help explain what's going on. Because some of you guys are like, what's wrong with this guy? Okay? Well, there's plenty of wrong with me, okay? I am, I'm, I'm what they call eccentric. The kids call that extra, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, there's some eccentric guys in the Bible. And, and some of you are probably asking, what does he have that stick for? Well, it's for a lot of things, for a lot of things. Um, and I have a bunch of names written on it, okay? And we'll get to that kind of towards the end. The, the students know, the student knows. And, and I've added some extra names, so... Here's my best impression of Elijah, an eccentric guy with a stick. All right, I can't grow that much facial hair, but if I could, I'd go full biblical, right? <laughs> full biblical, all right? I am the beneficiary of superpowers, all right? When properly applied, ADHD is a superpower, guys. Oh, man, it's great. When you're with kids, they're like, ooh, it's, you know, it's kind of coming in strong, all right? But when I was a kid, and you know, when I was in academy, Okay, but I didn't know I had ADHD, so I just white-knuckled my way through the Adventist school system. It was fantastic. All right? It was great. It's great. Pastor, teacher, chaplain. I'm a husband to Tammy. You guys met her. I am a father to Julian and Kay. And uh, yes, amen. Praise the Lord to, for that. I could never see myself as a father growing up. When I was their age over there, I was like, <laughs> never. And if I'm going to be a dad, it's going to be crazy because I don't, I can't, I couldn't like imagine myself growing up. A bit of a Peter Pan complex, right? Just be this happy little thought that you can fly, right? If you don't grow up, if you consider what the Bible says and you have a compendium of all these other people telling you, what do you do while you're waiting for Jesus to come back? What do you do? It's, it's our biggest problem that we have. And by the end of the sermon, it is my hope that people of all ages that are hearing my voice will re-examine what they do while they are waiting. Every single Ivy League school in this nation started out as a seminary. Did you know this? Every single Last one. What changed? How they waited for Jesus changed. What the focus was changed. And the focus should never, ever be lost. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to uh, do a little bit of a journey with me through three chapters in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 23, okay? And because uh, Pastor Dave does it, let's have some sort of kids questions. We don't have time to get the microphones out there because I'm greedy with my time. How much time do I have, by the way? Two hours? Huh? Hey, I'm Hispanic, man. Lunch is at three, all right? <laughs> Lunch is at three. Okay, no, we're not going to do that. I pastored many, many, you know, American Anglo-Saxon churches. You know, it's very important to end on time. It's very important. It's a, it's a spiritual gift, all right? Sort of questions. Matthew 23, what happens in that chapter? If you have your Bible, what happens in that chapter? And you can just yell it out. We're not going to do the mics. Does Jesus talk to people? Does Jesus talk to his disciples? Does Jesus talk to his religious leaders? 
or to the religious leaders, or D, all of the above? What do you say? Chorus. C? I heard D. Okay. Who's he talking to? B? D? A? C? It's D, guys. All of the above. But he's, he's specifically roasting who? Okay? Oh, man, he's really roasting the religious leaders. He's letting them have it. Okay? There's one week left until he dies. And he knows that he's going, what's going to happen. And he's just like, I no longer have to filter myself. Let me just tell you what I actually think. Okay? Listen, those religious leaders, and he's probably, he's at the temple, and he's pointing at them. I mean, I would have, I mean, sometimes when we read the Bible, we don't have Jesus' tone, right? And you read, I mean, you watch those Jesus, you know, I'm, how many of you guys are watching The Chosen? Oh, it's great. And you have the Jesus, oh, with the, with a special accent, and it, you know, it's very special, and the, it apparently makes him more foreign. Do you remember the Matthew Jesus, like he couldn't stop smiling? Or the Dino de Laurentiis Jesus that really needed a sandwich, right? Um, it's, it was, you know, we always interpret it through our filter. But to me, this was like a mic drop moment from Jesus. He was just there, and he was just, bah. You see those guys over there? They make you do unnecessary stuff. Everything they do is for show. One of the most important fundamental changes that happens in young people's lives is that moment when they realize that they have to do certain things to actually fit in with other adults. Because everybody, everybody else is putting on a mask. And that hang on moment of like, hey, I'm young and I'm gonna hang on to this, right? They, everything they do is for show. He calls them hypocrites, tells them that they are keeping people out of heaven, calls them sons of hell. Calls them foolish, blind, dirty, murderers, and snakes. Dirty was especially insulting because they prided themselves in being pure, ceremonially and physically. Calls them shiny, dead people. Okay? Yeah, whitewashed tombs. I'm just putting it there. But it's, it's basically what it is. You're shiny, dead people. You're dead inside. You're basically a zombie. Okay? With lots of makeup and highly functional. Tells them that they have blood on their hands, also an unclean thing. Tells them that their rules mean nothing if their hearts are off. And you will not see me again until it's too late. Okay, sort of kids questions. Matthew 24, guys, over here, help me out. Matthew 24, what does Matthew 24 talk about? I'm gonna open it up to my Matthew 24, okay? Because you know what, guys? I sit here in church all the time, and I just like half the time I'm just staring at you guys. And I know other people are staring at you, and I stare at other people. It's one of my hobbies. I just like watching people. Some people say it's creepy, and they're probably right. They're probably right. But I love watching people and what they're doing and whether or not they're engaged. Some of you can multitask, but some of you I have in my classes. I know you can't multitask, okay? All right? Matthew 24, what is it talking about? Is Jesus, talk, it, it, does Jesus, is Jesus talking about his time? Is he talking about the future? Is he talking about our time? Or D, all of the above? B? D? D, D. I like how you said that. D, yeah, I love that. All right. B, D, adults, you're super quiet. Look, you know, guys, you know what the adults are doing? They're like, I should know this. And if I say it out loud, people are going to know. <laughs> See, masks, it's, it's hard. It's hard being an adult. It's tough. Just be wrong. Be wrong with confidence, which, by the way, is the Argentinian motto, all right? <laughs> all right? If you're going to be wrong, be wrong with confidence, okay? <laughs> yes, what is it? B? No, it's D. It's all of the above. It's all of the above. As a Seventh-day Adventist, Matthew 24 was one of the most disturbing things for me to process. Why? Because Matthew 24, we are selective in how we read it. Is Matthew 24 talking about first century events? 100% is talking about first century events, okay? But for some reason, you know, somewhere in the 1940s, we were like, we need our kids to survive the tribulation times. We need them ready to run to the hills. 
We need to pray that they survive and that their flight be not on the Sabbath and that they not be pregnant, hopefully not pregnant. And then we made Pathfinder, right? So that they could survive the apocalypse. I got kicked out of Pathfinder. I am a master guide now, just letting you know. I came back, came back strong, came back strong, all right? People saw it, well, Pathfinder's not for this guy. In the middle of it, Jesus says, and this gospel will be preached unto all the world, and then the end will come. And then continues to describe these cataclysmic events that are happening everywhere. Right? And then it ends, it ends with what? Let me go through this. Jesus says Jerusalem is going to fall. His disciples ask when. And then he begins to describe the fall of Jerusalem. Terrible things are going to happen. People will be terrible to each other. When everyone hears the gospel, hey, the end will come. Pray that you can skip the bad stuff. Everyone's going to see me come back. Nature will give you hints about it. It will be like the times of Noah. Nobody knows when it will happen. More than any of the end time event stuff, and how many of you guys remember COVID? Remember that? That was awesome. Do you guys remember that? Educators, you with me? What a walk through paradise that was, right? Wow, just remote learning, kids pretending like they were looking at the screen and not having tabs open, doing God knows what else, and then unmuting themselves at the wrong moment. Oh, man, it was beautiful. I mean, just do a better job of hiding it. We can tell. Like, your eyes are very shiny. I see what you're looking at in your screen. And if you're wearing glasses, take them off, all right? Please. It's terrible. When we do not pay attention, in Matthew 23, in Matthew 24, and in Matthew 25, and the entirety of the sermon is going to be on Matthew 25, because in Matthew 25, we find out how to live in the waiting. Jesus tells you what you should be doing while you're waiting for Jesus to come back. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we really go hard on Matthew 24, don't we? Oh, man. And then what happens? Right? When you focus on the end time events, because like, how many times does Jesus say? It's like multiple times. You have no idea when I'm coming back. You have how many ideas? Zero. Come as a thief in the night. Okay? It's going to be a surprise. And when we live looking at the signs and focusing on the signs, Every time the Pope passes gas, we lose our minds. Okay? I'm sorry. The Pope's from my country right now. There's rumors going around that my dad went to school with one of his sisters or something. Oh, it's amazing. Everybody's related. Oh, he has an Advent disconnection. Watch out, Babylon. And should we watch out? What does Jesus say? Yeah, watch out. Watch, pray, endure. But it's going to be like the times of Noah. And so what kind of description do we have of the times of Noah? What were the times of Noah like? We have surprisingly little to go on. Most of what we have, we get it from E.G. Dubs, or Auntie Ellen, as I like to call her. If you guys haven't read Auntie Ellen, you should start. Man, she throws down. She goes hard. Because 19th century was different times. People got to say, she was wearing zero masks. She told people what was up all the time. All right? I grew up uh, having her shoved down my throat. And then I fell in love with Jesus. And I willingly shoved it down my throat. Yeah. It, it's just that, it's how it is. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 tells us, The Lord saw how bad the sins of man had become on the earth. And all of the thoughts in his hearts were always directly, only towards what was evil. We can sit here and debate whether or not we've reached that stage. If you actually read Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, what does it say? This is the description that it gives you. It gives you, it says this, 37, 37 through 39, it says, 
but that day and hour, no one knows. Uh, that's verse 36, sorry. But as the days of the Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. <sighs> Auntie Ellen in uh, Patriots and Prophets, chapter 6 and 7 and then I like this quote here from the Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, page 68. It says, they even denied the existence. It's talking about the time of Adam. Ten generations in. They even denied the existence of God of heaven and gloried in and worshipped the works of their own hands. It says that they were like competing with each other about who had the best house. You know, I, I remember the first time I drove into Scottsdale. I was like, ooh, people are competing here. This is, it's nice. But they would grow their houses. They were like tree houses and stuff like that. She describes this amazing thing. Can you imagine that? Ten generations down, and you met... Sorry. Let's go. Uh, and you met the man with no belly button, and you were like, there's no God. You met him. You went like, whoop, no belly button. And you said, there is no God. She spends a ton of time describing the fact that they were smarter stronger, faster, more capable at every single way. How many of you guys have watched Star Trek? It was like Khan. Yeah, it's basically like Khan. Yeah, exactly. I am better in every way. That's what they were. They lived longer. But they still found the way to say there is no God. What's the first angel's message? What's the first angel's message? You, you guys should know, but I'm going to put the, the adults on the spot. What is it? Fear God and give Him glory. Worship the Lord God of heaven who made the heavens and the earth. We're having, we're having that seminar. Today, that is the question. Is God real? Can we prove it? It's the same exact situation. And it tells us what were the times of Noah like. People, listen. Listen. If you are marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking, are you being persecuted in the traditional sense? <sighs> are people in China and North Korea that choose to be Christians persecuted in the traditional sense? 100%. How are you being persecuted? In a way more dangerous way. Through feeling good and living a life in the waiting that has no urgency for Jesus because heaven is on earth and not in heaven. And it is attainable. If we get the right degree, if we earn the right amount of money, if we marry the right person, if we break out, if we become famous, if we make it. So, Matthew 25 breaks down into three parts. Jesus tells us how to live in the waiting. Matthew 25, parable one. What is the oil for? Remember, there's these ten virgins, right? And they have oil, right? It's like a parable. It's the last parables he tells, okay? Parable two, how should we use what we're given? The parable of the talents. There's these three servants. They get a, a different amount of talents, each one of them. And then finally, an allegory versus analogy, I, I couldn't really pinpoint which one it is. English teachers, help me out, okay? Allegory versus analogy about what the good and the bad are doing while waiting. Final sort of, sort of kid's question. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. How many virgins fall asleep? How many virgins? Five of them, the five that are ready, the five that are foolish, D, A, and C, or E, all of them. D, A, and C? Trick question. E, yeah, probably. You wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe how many people I ask this question from, and they always answer what? Five. How many fall asleep? Okay, yeah, and I was going to go off too and after that, so we got to stop, right? How many of you like sleeping? What a gift from the gods, right? How many of you guys are planning your, you plan your Sabbath around sleep? 
Yeah? How many of you there are there? I remember in the Sabbath, my father had very strict rules about la siesta. <laughs> la santa siesta. The holy, holy nap. Okay? And we were made to nap on Sabbath, which I found to be an abomination. I didn't know. Yes, I know. I'm with you, buddy. But, you know, you know, like adults, they just don't bounce back like you do, man. They need to, like, KO for a while. And I get it. I remember, you know, it was supposed to be a Sabbath of rest. And I would, I don't know if my parents are watching or they will watch this sometime. And I always apologize because I talk about my parents. I'm sorry, mommy. Sorry, puppy. And just the rage my dad would feel if we would wake him up or he would find out that we snuck out during Sabbath. Because it's not, it was for the safety of others, let's be honest. They just wanted to know where we were, okay? My brother and I, I do have a brother. He also teaches or, or was teaching or is teaching right now in Campion, just up in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> Sleeping. The mind is wheeling, the heart, the heart is willing, but the body is weak. How many fall asleep? All of them. Now, another thing that we forget about this story is how the engagement process went back then, okay? And the engagement process is incredibly tied in to the Last Supper that we celebrate, we call communion, we wash each other's feet, and it's actually tied to the commoner's version of how to, uh, you know, propose to somebody else. Okay, back then, if you wanted to propose to somebody, kids, help me out. I think I shared it with you guys in one of the Vespers. How did you propose, right? If you were rich, your parents arranged it for you. If you were not rich, you actually went to a wedding, and in the wedding, the girls were on one side, and the guys were on another, and they were looking at each other. It's like, oh God. I, I remember I, I walked in today, and there was like a ton of guys just gathered by the bathroom. Sometimes the girls go together to the bathroom because, you know, they need support. I don't understand. Um... <laughs> And the guy's on the other side, and the, the concept was you could grab a cup of wine, and you would go over to a girl, and if she took the cup of wine and drank it, it, was, it signified that you had committed to be engaged with that person. Of course, there's a ton of preliminaries before. It's not like they weren't talking before. It's not like things weren't going around. It's, like that, it's not like the interest wasn't relayed to other people. And so that was called, it was a range versus request. It's called the betrothal. And then if she drank it, the guy immediately was like, poof, poof, smoke. Ran back to either his father's house, if he had a father's house, or he went and prepared a place for her and did not come back until he had a place to bring her to. Behold, I tell you, if it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Take, drink, this is my blood. It's engagement language. It's beautiful. The return was supposedly unexpected. <laughs> so the parable is like the, the, the guy, okay, so the fact that they have, you know, like lamps ready meant that they kind of sort of knew when the, the, the groom was coming, and so they had to get prepped for that. They had to get ready. It's like, he's coming, I heard he's coming, but I don't know if he's coming, but we should all be ready because he's coming, but we don't know if he's coming. We're not supposed to tell. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. And they were just waiting. Are these virgins, are these virgins part of the wedding party? Let's remember that. Let's remember that before you get to the part that disturbs everybody else when you get to the last two verses in that section. So, supposedly unexpected, what is their job? Why do they have lights? The Talmud tells us that the lights and the number of virgins was actually had something to do with something cultural back then, but we can't any find any references in the Bible about it. What was the lights for? He comes in the midnight hour, which is not necessarily midnight, but it's just like a ridiculous time to start a wedding, okay? If he's coming like at midnight, that's ridiculous, right? And, and, but not ridiculous to them, because weddings usually took... If you were poor, maybe three days. If you were rich, could take up to two weeks. Can you imagine just throwing down for two weeks? Just people just like, pa, 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 pa. <laughs> Eating and drinking nonstop. Like, oh, you know, I love their dancing and everything. It's fantastic. Can you imagine that? 
So, and it brings me to that. There's the wedding, right? And there's a closed door. Why? If your wedding is that long and that bountiful, and back then you maybe had one, maybe two good meals a day because it took a lot of labor to actually have your meal, right? What did you want to close it off for? No freeloaders, guys. All right? You belong to the wedding party or not. So the virgins are there to light the way for the groom. That's their entire job. To light the way for the groom. Remember, engagement, wedding, language. How do we live in the waiting? There is excitement about the wedding. There's an attitude of readiness while we wait. And how many of you grew up hearing this story and finding yourself filled with feelings of dread, fear, about readiness? Raise your hand, don't be shy. If you're Seventh-day Adventist, you should at least have two fingers, you know, just like the, just like the medieval one. You know, yeah, like that, all right? There was a feeling of dread. There was a feeling of dread I grew up with, and I resented my parents for it. I resented my church for it. I resented the message for it. Wait a minute, aren't I saved by grace? What is this trash of me having to do extra stuff afterwards? Either I get grace or I don't get grace. What is this about? What were the virgins supposed to be ready for as a chorus? The coming of the? You got it. You guys are really smart, all right? What does the oil represent? All right. How do you know it's the Holy Spirit? Does it tell you that in the parable? Now, look at me making you all doubt everything because I'm just throwing a bunch of curveballs and everybody's like, did we read the same Bible? Yes, we read the same Bible. Absolutely, it's the Holy Spirit, but I got you. I had you going for a bit. Admit it. Everybody's nervous. My kids really complain about that. My students, and by kids, I mean my students. They're like, we don't know when you're serious and when you're not, were you joking? <laughs> That's what it is, smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. No, I do that at, not just because I have ADHD, but because that's how I learn, and that's how you get a person to actually think. Because every single ounce of information, anybody below your age, if you're listening to below my age, is processing information with a changing point of reference of 2.5 seconds. Okay? So I have to do it that way. Plus, I can't help but do it that way. Plus, it's fun. Look at your faces. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. So can you borrow the Holy Spirit? Why ask for the Holy Spirit? I believe it's the greatest need Seventh-day Adventism has today. The Holy Spirit. And having it is very, very important. So, what does it mean to have enough oil? Enough Holy Spirit? Knowing enough? Getting into the party? Being ready? Which one is it? Paul says, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Don't be filled with anything. It's actually talking about being drunk. But be filled with the Spirit, it says later on. Be filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Is this place filled with the Spirit? I hope so. Is every single person here inside this place filled with the Spirit? I doubt it because I see what you're doing with your phones. Can the Spirit be in a place? Because I remember feeling like that and knowing that and feeling, and it's like, oh, the Holy Spirit is in this place. And that's, that's the, the hardness of church, the hardness of the authenticity of being in a group of people that supposedly follow God but don't feel the real moment. Good nod, Jonathan. You really sold that one. All right, it's good. I love it. Remember, the Holy Spirit is something and someone who fills your life and is there to fill your life for what particular purpose? To bring people past the shut door. And the shut door has scared so many people. But remember what Jesus says in John chapter 10. I am the door. 
Anyone who enters through me will be saved. They will go in and out. They will find plenty of food. Jesus is talking about it in the context of being a shepherd. He's also the door to the door pen where the, she where the sheep are. Shameless plug for a week of prayer in October. The whole thing is based on doors. Okay? Come if you want. I'm trying to get the kids and maybe Mr. Nathan to start building some doors. We're going to have doors with different things. It's going to be great. Jesus is the door. He controls who comes in. And we're always thinking and we're always finding creative new ways to tell somebody whether or not they will make it through the door. It is not your job to tell somebody else if they're going through the door or not. How many people have we hurt? How many people are we going to continue to hurt? So what is our motivation for having enough oil? Why did the foolish virgins, why were the foolish virgins not able to go in? Hey, they went and got more oil. Holy Spirit, right? What is the parable, start, what is the parable talking about? What was their job? Repeat it back to me. What was their job? To light the way for the groom. And every single thing in Matthew 25 hinges around the motivation of the person that is waiting for the groom. It's the time before the second coming, right? Why should you have enough oil? Are you going to fall asleep? Chances are guaranteed you're going to fall asleep. Jesus is saying, how many of them fall asleep? All of them. So when the time comes, you have enough oil to do what? Hey, you in the town. Hey, you neighbor. Here comes Jesus. Let me shine a light and show you his face. That's it. And this gospel will be preached unto all the earth. And then the end will come. You need the Holy Spirit to do what God asked you to do. So, young people, and I wish the rest of the academy was here. If you're trying to decide who you're going to marry, what your life is going to look like, what your career is going to be, um, how much money you're going to make, if you're anxious about those things, stressed about those things, and in the middle of that entire conversation, it's all about you and not how any of those things are going to lead other people to Jesus, you're doing it wrong. And there's probably some people here listening to what I'm saying that are grown, that are feeling some feelings of dread because of the motivation of how they approached it. Maybe some, even some regret as to how they did it. I certainly have waking nightmares sometimes about that. But you have waking nightmares if you're afraid. Afraid of what? What role do the virgins play in the wedding? The answers have to do with the attitude while waiting for Jesus to return. And why is Jesus so harsh at the door? Check out what he says in his only sermon. The Sermon on the Mount only has one sermon. Did you know that? Jesus only has one sermon. Matthew 5 through 7. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The other one says, and again at the end of the second parable, they will be cast out in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I just Sometimes I tell people if they come late to my class. You know. If you're afraid, how are you going to look at the guy at the door? He's oppressive. He's judgmental. He's arbitrary. And he's kind of just thinking about what he wants. But the flip side is also true. You're just thinking about you. You want more Holy Spirit. By the way, do you need the Holy Spirit to prophesy in the name of Jesus? Do you need the Holy Spirit to cast out demons in your name? Do you need the Holy Spirit to do many mighty works? Oh. So then who can be saved, asked the disciples to Jesus. Your motivation, your attitude in the waiting matters. How are you looking at the people that need to come in through the door? 
If you're looking at yourself and thinking about your own Holy Spirit and your own entrance through the door, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because it saves me. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because I'm saved. I don't keep the Ten Commandments because I'm saved or because it saves me, because I keep them because I am saved. I don't ask for the Holy Spirit so that I can feel mightier and holier. I ask for the Holy Spirit because when people meet me, they're like, ooh, yikes. Then they meet my wife and they're like, oh, okay, employable. <laughs> so without the Holy Spirit, things are dire. And you will not portray Jesus in the right way. With the Holy Spirit, you are more palatable. You are shiny. You are bright. And you are, people aren't looking at you. They're looking at your lamp, which is pointing to... Isn't that great? It's not about you. It's about Jesus. There's no stress. There's no fear. It's all about Jesus. And Jesus decides who goes through the door. You don't need to determine that. You don't need to qualify that. You don't need to gauge that. You don't need to rate that. You don't need to rank that. Next slide. Hopefully we get to the next slide. Boom. Oh, I went, there it is, there it is. So, Jesus says, I don't know you. Why? Because of these three things. Do you want people to see the groom coming? Ask yourself this question. Do you want to see Jesus come back? Are you an Adventist? Are you really an Adventist? Do you, want to sp do you want people to see the groom coming? Are you afraid? Ask yourself a question. And if you're afraid, why? I'm not afraid. Why am I not afraid? Because it's not about me. It's not about my merits. True religion and false religion was decided a long time ago between two brothers. They stood in Genesis 4 doing something that God didn't ask them to do. They brought offerings to God. One of them brought what? His own stuff. And what is our own stuff in front of God? It is as filthy rags. And the other one brought what? A representation of what God was going to do for them. True religion, false religion. That's it. That's where the story ends. Everything else outside of there is just a derivation of that story. And finally, are you committed to be ready, which is what the next parable is about. Investment. Attitude of investment while we wait. There are many parents that are sending their kids to this school, hoping that the investment will pay off. Hopefully, the focus of that investment is on the right things. And not because, for some reason, you think that sending your child to be taught by an eccentric ADHD guy will somehow guarantee passage through the door. God forbid! You are in deep trouble! Who is the master in that story of the talents? Obviously Jesus. Who are the servants? Obviously us. What are the talents? Something we can grow based on what we can handle. Look at the story. He only gave each one according to what they can handle. Some people can handle things better. Listen, if it was silver, if, if he gave them talents of silver, it was anywhere between like $1,500 to $30,000 per talent. If it was gold, it was anywhere between $20,000 to $100,000, depending on how you measure talents. And there's different interpretations of that. It's not insignificant. And he gave them something. And by the way, do they belong to the kingdom? Do they belong to the house of the master? What did he give them? He gave them his own stuff. What assignment did Jesus leave us until he comes back? Can somebody quote me Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20? By the way, 80% of Adventists quote this wrong. What does it say? Go ye therefore and... Wrong. It's not teach. It's make disciples. Look at every single evangelistic series for the past three decades. What do we do? 
We teach the garbage out of people. We are right. I hope that you are Judeo-Christian and you have that kind of a background. What does Jesus say? You make disciples, which is highly messy. Come do what I do. Follow me. Then you baptize, and then you teach them to do all the things that I've commanded you. 80% of Adventists quote this wrong. Why? Because we look at God's work in, in, in the wrong way. What God has asked us to do is extremely messy. It's crazy. You're asking people that haven't been quote-unquote converted to start doing what Jesus asked them to do. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Right? He's not slack according to his promise, as some count slackness. Not willing that any should perish. When is the master coming back? We already quoted this one. The light has to go into all the world. You don't have to convince people of the light. You just have to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. Are we? I don't know about show. No. Everything you do from here on out, every relationship, everything that you do, let's not lose the mission because you're going to lose your attitude of how to wait for Jesus to come back. Because by the way, when does the door shut? When does the door shut? What is our entire salvation based on, freshmen? Freshmen, what is our entire salvation based on? The, f the blank of what? The freedom of choice, which is also the source of all suffering in the world. God gave us the freedom of choice. When can you no longer make any choices? When you're dead or when you see him? Period. So if you're wondering about time of trouble, if you're wondering about, oh, shut door theory and all this other stuff, find me the verses first in the Bible that corroborate what you're thinking, and then move past the concept of freedom of choice. You're really going to argue to me that you're not going to be able to make choices for what? Like an extended period of time before Jesus comes back? That's not what it's saying. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Woo! It's exciting. It's exciting. It's very exciting. You cannot lose the excitement. The good investor wants what the master wants. Wants the talent of the master to multiply. Well done, good and faithful servant. And the bad investor, what? Is filled with what? Fear. A person who is waiting for Jesus to come back cannot be the most fearful person in the room. They have to be the most hopeful, the most joyous, the most optimistic person in the room. Why? Because who's fighting on your side? The one who conquered death. The one who rescued everyone from the terribleness that is this life. You can't lose. It's exciting. The bad investor doesn't want what the master wants. Does the bare minimum. Is afraid of the master. I know you're a hard man. Reaping where you do not sow. Oh. Here, take your stuff. Jesus is telling something very, very specific about how to live before he comes back. Toss him outside into the darkness and unquenchable sadness. I am not afraid of the unquenchable sadness. You know why? Because I am excited about what Jesus asked me to do. I want what God wants. Right now, it's pretty obvious because I'm preaching, you know, and I, sh I should be probably selling this thing pretty strong. There are some dark moments of the soul when I go back home and Satan comes in after the Holy Spirit leaves and <laughs> bah, 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 bah. you're terrible. Everybody's judging you. You're, you're too eccentric. Oh, you scared everybody else. You're never going to get to preach again. It happens. Everybody does it. Look at Elijah. First Kings 18. The entire nation sees fire coming down from heaven. In 1 Kings 19, what does he do? Goes into a massive depression, wants God to help him die. Because one lady's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Marathon pass out. Okay. <laughs> right? Take my life, Lord. I want what God wants. And I need help and I need to continue asking him for help, which is called the Holy Spirit to invade my life and help me do things that I could not possibly do on my own. 
the instinctive attitude of love while we wait is how I end it today, and I'm sorry for going over time. I know I'm five over. Bear with me, Caucasians. We got this. All right? We got this. Hopefully, the point of reference changed enough times, and you're like, you're not, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay? We're here, okay? Allegory versus analogy. Instinctive attitude of love while we wait. What do we do while we're waiting for Jesus to come back? Look at this. Who will separate the good from the bad? Obviously, Jesus. Who are the righteous? You and me. Are you part of the wedding party? Do you want Jesus to come back? Then you are part of the wedding party. Do you want to let your light shine? Then you are part of the wedding party. Zero fear. It's exciting. What are they doing while they wait? They are caring for the least of these, and they don't even realize it. It's beautiful. It's so simple. You don't need a theology degree to give food to the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to visit those who are sick, to visit those who are in prison, to visit the elderly, to care for the least of these. Do you want what the master wants? How simple is this gospel message? Even looking at it from the end time scenario. What does God want to find you doing? So, if you're going to go into law, kids, which you guys are still clocked out, it's cool, it's cool, I see you. We'll catch up, we'll catch up later. It's all good. If you're going to be a lawyer, if you're going to be a doctor, if you're going to be a teacher, how is that going to help you love the least of these? Before we berate and point fingers or educational institutions and all that other stuff for where they've lost their way or where they're doing it wrong, I don't know if we can win that political fight and, you know, when they get too huge and the money is big and all this other stuff. Where can the change actually take place? In your home, in your sphere of influence. Is the mission clear? Is your attitude clear? about how to wait for Jesus to come back. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that people will notice. I guarantee it. And it will pay off in dividends. Hoard oil. (laughs) Hoard it. You're already part of the wedding party. Have the Holy Spirit to bring more people into the party. Develop talent so that you can grow God's kingdom while we wait. Don't grow it because you're afraid. Grow it because you're a part of the kingdom. Love the least of these. Why? Because you're learning to love like Jesus loved. Period. That's it. That's the three parts of Matthew 25. Hoard oil, develop talent, and love the least of these. How hard is that to remember? It's not. And I have ADHD, and I'll probably forget that I preached this to you two weeks from now, okay? But you're going to remind me, because some of you don't have ADHD, and you're like, but pastor, you said, okay? That's how we keep each other accountable. That's what church is. It's an accountability process, where hopefully you can be real in the fact that we're all, do-do-do, (laughs) do-do-do, we're sleeping. And if you see Jesus coming, it's time to wake up. This is my attitude. This is actually my prayer stick, as I call it. It does have Proverbs 23, 13 written on it, which is, it's not the one you think. It's even funnier. Do not withhold correction from your child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he will not die. Right? But nobody gets hit with this. They just get hit with prayer. Every single one of these names is a story. And they're serious stories. And so my concept is always like, if you see me with a stick, it means that I'm praying. And when you pray for people, when you ask for God, you should look different. You know what the fastest religion, growing religion is right now, seniors? What's the fastest growing religion, seniors? Huh? Islam. Absolutely. They will outnumber Christians by 2050. Why? Because people know that they are Muslims where? Everywhere. And despite having a weird message that doesn't adhere itself to grace, 
doesn't acknowledge God doing things for you, you have to do, it's going to grow. Why? Because people see that something is different. What is different about you? What is your Nazarite vow? I don't, you know, I, I cut my hair, so I messed it up there. I, I don't touch, I don't touch the, the, the grapes or the, well, I do touch the grapes, but not alcoholic grapes. That's why they didn't, weren't allowed to touch the grapes. They weren't allowed to touch dead things, so they were essentially vegan or vegetarian. So all of that stuff, all of that extra Seventh-day Adventist stuff is supposed to make you a better, shiny person for God. I've chosen a stick, and those that know, know that when you carry it and when you pray for people, it should make you look different. It's inconvenient. You have to carry it with you everywhere and everywhere. That's why kids can't touch it because it's not hygienic, okay? It goes everywhere. <laughs> Plus, if you're not going to pray for these people, you can't touch it either. This is my struggle. And it begins a conversation. When they ask me about it, guess what I get to tell them about? My walk with God. It happens at airports. It happens in stores. It happens everywhere. I mean, I, I, I didn't... I, I saw Alex here, but I don't see him anymore. I didn't have the courage to take it into the Diamondbacks game, but, you know, because they really check you out, and they're like, you know, I don't know, br bring your own bat to, to, to game day. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. What is your attitude, and can people tell that you are waiting for Jesus? If it's your decision, and if it's your choice, if it's your desire today to wait for Jesus, I invite you to stand with me as I pray to close. Wait for Jesus in an obvious way. Heavenly Father, thank you for the patience of all these wonderful people. People who are in different stages of their journey. People who are at all given times struggling with this attitude of how to wait. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you help us wait in an authentic way. And if we're going to struggle with the waiting, help us to struggle together. Help us to feed off of each other. Encourage, if some of us are not struggling that much, lift up those that are struggling. And, then, and if, that, if the roles reverse, help us to do that. And pick each other up. Remind each other, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, encourage each other with these words. Words about the second coming of Jesus. Fill our lamps with oil, Heavenly Father. I pray it in the name of Jesus, who has gifted us with this incredible task of bringing the light of salvation to the world. We love you. We miss you. We wait for you. In the name of Jesus.